pleasure to introduce our speaker and our topic for this morning. We're going to learn about EAWLC, East and West Learning Connection, the nonprofit federally registered program that our speaker founded to break cultural barriers and assist newcomers of different heritages to learn about Canadian ways and help them more easily connect with their new communities. What a great idea. Young Wang is the founder and president of EAWLC. It's based in Toronto, it's not for profit, and its purpose is to sh share Canadian culture, customs, and conversations with newcomers. Now, Young was born in Hefei, Ch China. I always have to look to make sure my pronunciations are correct. Born in Hefei, China, Young worked in export sales, managing as vice general manager of a Shanghai trading company. Young holds a master's degree in economics from Indiana University. She's the mother of two university students. She came to Canada in 2010 and has been doing volunteer work ever since, mostly familiarizing immigrants with Canadian culture to help them adapt to life here more readily. Young is also a radio talk show host for Accessible Media Inc. And now I'm going to walk her to the stage and please welcome Young. Oh, well, well, thank you very much, Sheila, for that nice introduction. And thanks to um, Don Heiss for inviting me here. So I'm very much honored to be here and to uh, meet with everyone. Uh, I, I really hope it's a conversation. Um, so uh, please do not hesitate to ask me any questions. Uh, then I'll get to know about your thoughts and probably listen to some of your stories as well. Um, Sheila wa wanted me to talk about East and West Learning Connections. Um, let me begin with how I started it, uh, why I want to do this. Um, so I, I grew up in China until I was 28. Uh, that year I went to the States uh, to realize uh, my dream. So <laughs> I, I spent six years there, both of, uh, of my boys were born there. I got my master's degree, then I went back to Shanghai, worked uh, a couple of years, then I came here, my whole family immigrated here, so now Toronto is our home. Um, so being a first generation immigrant myself, I, I have always been interested in learning other cultures, and I have observed um, the, some barriers, like obstacles, uh, for my like fellow Chinese immigrants here, how well or badly they, they do here, um, how they're accepted or not accepted here, uh, the barriers. Because the language is a big barrier. Um, till today, I, I'm still trying to improve my English because uh, many times I cannot find the right words um, or to ex uh, express myself. Um, you know, in those little talk, like small talks or in a meeting, everything happened very quickly and you, if you cannot find the right word, uh, then, then it's done. And you would uh, look uh, quite awkward um, or even maybe sometimes people will think you're impolite. And uh, even if you, you know, language is not a big problem for you anymore, uh, more subtle things in the culture uh, matters. Um, I'll give you some examples. Um, when I first arrived in the United States, uh, that was in Indianapolis, the first culture shock I had was, like strangers on the streets, they would smile at you and say hi. So that was not, uh, you know, the case in China. So I, um, I would smile back, I would say hi, but I just feel awkward, I feel very shy. Um, and it took me a while to be able to smile back uh, naturally. So I didn't feel you know, uncomfortable, very uh, awkward. And it took me even longer to be able to initiate the greetings. Um, but once I, I uh, you know, I'm 
accustomed to it. Uh, now I, I just do it every time um, you know I, I encounter people, and I would feel um, uh, unnatural not to do this. Uh, another example would be this one is is easier because um, um, when I saw people hold the door for the person behind you, that was not uh, practice in China. But once I saw it, I said, "Oh, that is really nice," and, and I want to do it, and and I can do it pretty easily. So ever since uh, I, the first time I saw it, I began to do it, and when I uh, went back to China. I uh, I do it all the time, and uh, to my surprise, like pre pre uh, pleasant surprise, uh, that people in China, especially in big cities like Shanghai, uh, more people are doing this. Probably because uh, more people coming back from overseas, so they they are exposed to uh, nice things um, from the outside world. Um, and some of you may notice uh, your Chinese colleague, co-workers, they might be quiet in, in the meeting. Um, so except for language, um, you know, personality. In my culture, so people value more of uh, doers than talkers. So actually, if you're quite eloquent, um, very talkative, people might, uh, you know, cast some doubt on your integrity or you know, <laughs> whether you can do as well as what you talk. And we didn't have enough uh, training on presentation skills um, in school. I don't know what, what is it now in China, um, but in my times, we almost never uh, practice that. So, so if you don't find me a, a good uh, speaker here, <laughs> don't blame me. <laughs> All right. Um, and, and also, there is racism um, existing um, in, in the, uh, here. Um, some are m manifesting, uh, say, like, uh, go back to home, like, like shout. But some are more subtle, uh, but could have deeper impact on you. Uh, for example, University of Toronto and uh, TMU, like Metropolitan University, uh, once did a joint research. Uh, and they republished their, their result in 2017. Um, so they sent out resumes, like fake resumes, with the same uh, Canadian experience to employers across the country. And they found out um, people with an Asian name, they received 20% uh, less chance uh, to get a call for an interview from big employers and almost 40% less chance to, you know, from uh, small to medium sized employers. So what to do with this? Like, how can we do uh, to improve all this? Uh, I think diversity is a two way process. So we, we want the mainstreams to uh, be more open minded, um, to be more tolerant, um, more, more inclusive. But at the same time, I think uh, as uh, new immigrants, we need to learn more about Canadian culture here as well, uh, improve our communication skills, um, so um, we can communicate with people in the way they, they, they can accept. Uh, we have a lot to learn, and also there are problems, like our own problems, like in the Chinese community here, we face a lot of problems as well. Because um, we come from a different country, uh, some of the values, and they're not like we're not exposed to like multi uh, races, like races there. So some people uh, might hold uh, quite a, a racist attitude toward other people as well. Um, so we have a lot of things to learn uh, and to communicate with other people. Uh, that's um, why I wanted to do this. Uh, when my big boy, uh, Eric, uh, uh, went to grade nine uh, at the uh, Agent Court Collegiate Institute at the uh, high school, public high school in Scarborough, so I asked around um, a handful of uh, Chinese parents 
and us and their kids, we started to learn. So the, the very uh, first book we, we learned is um, Emily Post's etiquette book. So uh, yeah, a very thick uh, chapter book. Um, so we wanted to learn about the communication skills here, the customs here. And along the way, uh, I would invite people, uh, experts in, in their fields, to come over, give a lecture. And I invited uh, people of different uh, cultural background to come over, have a dialogue with us. And th that's pretty much uh, we are still doing today. We call it the East and West Dialogue. Because um, uh, at that very individual level, when people exchange their life experience, their thoughts, or some concerns, um, then that's uh, how we can understand each other and understand at the end of the day, we are actually the same. Um, uh, so we can embrace more this uh, diversity and inclusion idea, truly. Um, so we were lucky um, in 2017, the uh, principal of the elementary school my little son went to uh, was very supportive. She lent their staff room to us. So we went there uh, meet weekly. It's, it's, it's like a Toastmasters uh, a meeting that we practice our public speech skills in English. Um, uh, but then uh, TDSB changed their policy. So uh, we lost uh, the facility um, in 2020. But anyway, in 2020, everything stopped because the pandemic hit. Um, but uh, in the middle of the year, 2020, uh, we started to uh, organize events um, online. So everything went zo on Zoom. And uh, in 2021, uh, I was very lucky to be joined by a group of friends who shared the same vision and passion, um, but with different talents. And uh, we turned it into a federally registered nonprofit organization. Um, it's run totally by volunteers, so everyone uh, is volunteer. I like Ping, um, she is uh, on the board now. Um, I am a volunteer as well. Everyone uh, work very hard, um, but uh, we do things really seriously. I mean, I, we make efforts. Uh, so if you visit our website uh, in the events area, you will see uh, in the past seven years, we organized uh, more than 250 cultural events wow. for the public for free. Um, we, would, we are able to do this because um, many people uh, from all walks of life, uh, they are very supportive. They want to help immigrants. They come to share uh, as like volunteer guest speakers. So I'm very grateful to all these people uh, and to my board directors to my members um, we we all you know try our best uh, to to do something um, like the lady right now uh, it's we are in a really chaotic world um, sometimes it's it's you know you, you feel hopeless but if we do something positive even though uh, little things like we are doing um, it, it gives us hope um, so uh, that is pretty much uh, about uh, the East and West Learning Connections. And I, I really, um, like, I cordially invite you to join us. If you find some events interesting, you're more than welcome to join. And or you can help us maybe make more people to know about us so more people can benefit from our programs. Uh, right now, we, we have several monthly programs like uh, English Social Conversation, that's uh, uh, native uh, English speaking volunteers come to facilitate conversations with immigrants uh, so the immigrants can um, enhance their conversational skills, but at the same time, people get to exchange their thoughts on different topics or uh, share their life stories. We have uh, we invited a very good uh, communication skills coach, so he will be sitting there answering people's questions, um, and we have like this East and West dialogue events. Uh, we have book talks where authors or translators they come to facilitate uh, 
introduce a book and facilitate the discussions. We have social reading club. Uh, people read together, chapter by chapter, and they, they bring in their own life experience. Um, we, have, we have a lot of uh, uh, yeah, programs, um, and sometimes we make a few trips to, to uh, museums. Um, raw, um, AGO is very kind to um, you know, offer us a free admission to their uh, museum. Yeah, so um, yeah, people are helping us, and um, uh, we try very hard uh, to do our share. Um, and I, I'd like to uh, like leave with you a quote I, I read uh, uh, a couple of years ago, a book called uh, The Hidden Life of uh, Trees. Uh, it's a nonfiction book by a German forester, but when I read this passage, I was really touched. I think we can learn a lot from trees, actually. Um, I cannot uh, read it uh, uh, word by word, so I would like to invite uh, uh, Sheila to please read it for me. And after that, if we still have some time, I'd like to entertain everybody by reciting a poem <laughs> I wrote, because um, uh, like uh, for, for thanking you for uh, being so patient with me. <laughs> Thank you, Yang. I, I'm going to read the poem now, but don't go away. Be, um, the passage I'll read from this book, The Hidden Life of Trees, by Peter Wollaban. I'm probably not pronouncing that. It's probably Wollaban. That's the right name. Yeah, Wollaban. I went to hear him speak at OISE, and uh, yes, he's really into the idea that trees need each other and support each other and talk to each other through their root systems. It's all very fascinating. So here's the reading. Why trees are such social beings. Why they share food with other trees and sometimes other species. There are advantages to working together. A tree is not a forest. On its own, a tree cannot establish a consistent local climate it is at the mercy of wind and weather. But together, many trees create an ecosystem that moderates extremes of heat and cold, stores a great deal of water, and generates a great deal of humidity. And in this protected environment, trees can live to be very old. To get to this point, the community must remain intact no matter what. If every tree were looking out only for itself, then quite a few of them would never reach old age. Regular fatalities would result in many large gaps in the tree canopy, which would make it easier for storms to get inside the forest and uproot more trees. The heat of summer would reach the forest floor and dry it out. Every tree would suffer. Every tree, therefore, is valuable to the community and worth keeping around for as long as possible. And that is why even sick individuals are supported and nourished until they recover. Next time, perhaps it will be the other way round, and the supporting tree might be the one in need of assistance. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, yeah I was touched by this passage. Um, yeah, every, everyone met us. Yeah, every color matters. Um, yeah, that's that's um, my thinking. That's Thank nice. Yeah. Now, are you ready to take some questions and have some discussion? Because we're about to move into the portion of our program where people in the audience or people on Zoom mm -hmm. would come up to the mic and ask a question or reflect. I I've been doing some reflecting, and I mentioned our eight principles, and your talk specifically concerns our newly approved, less than two years old, eighth principle, which was democratically arrived at by all the congregations of Unitarians across Canada. And it's all about fighting racism. And I think we're the first faith group anywhere to actually encode and cement that anti-racist value into a principle where we're committed to stamping it out in institutions, in ourselves, 
wherever it is that we are committed to that principle. So I think that's pretty cool on the part of Unitarians and it certainly applies to what you're speaking about today. So my comment or question really is about the pandemic that you mentioned. You lost the school room and the, all around that period things were changing and you mentioned the racism and I'm wondering what changed on that front after the pandemic hit. Was there uh, more challenges presented in that climate than you had experienced prior? Um, well, like uh, things are not getting uh, too good, like for, for the Chinese community, because uh, the situation between um, Canada and China is, is at odd. Um, so I think we, we really, we, we kind of uh, are caught between communism and racism. So <laughs> it's, um, it's unfortunate, um, but uh, the only solution I can think of, maybe no solution, but uh, what we can do, like we um, stand up uh, firmly uh, to pro-democracy, uh, to go against the dictatorship, but uh, I'm also against uh, racism. So they're both oppressive um, to deprive people, you know, of certain origin or certain status of uh, equal rights. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, only people come together, share their thoughts, like what's truly on their minds, and we can maybe um, come up with some workable solutions. So, yeah. Okay, the floor is open. Sharon? Well, I feel really connected to this whole thing because I live right in the Agent Court neighborhood. Um, I actually taught at Agent Court Collegiate for four years, mathematics, oh. back in, way back. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to tell you how so far back, but I'd love to. And she went to high school mm -hmm. at Agent Court Collegiate. Mm -hmm. And I also um, went to a girls high school, Loretto Abbey, so I'm, I feel bonded with the girls here from St. Clements. Mm -hmm. There's another little connection too, but I'll tell you that later. Um, anyway, it's, it's really great. One of the things when I was in, at Agent Court, it was pretty much all white. When my, my kids went to Agent Court, it became much more multicultural. And my son, which I'm really proud of, he has friends from every culture. Like he's got Chinese friends and Trinidadian friends and white friends, he's got everything. And they played rugby together and had a really good time. And the same with my two daughters that went there. And um, now, my one concern right now is that it's so Asian that I wonder if they're getting enough time to practice. Like, if they come straight from China, they could talk ch the Chinese language to one another all the time. And I wonder if they're going to get enough practice with other friends mm -hmm. um, when they're at school. Because that's really, really important, those casual conversations that you have. Yes. Um, I do think people need to go outside their comfort zone and uh, um, be part of the uh, community here uh, to, to um, practice your English because English is our common language and uh, to um, also participate like by uh, going to different activities or going to church uh, uh, doing volunteer work um, so you get to know how this society is working um, how uh, like when you be part of it you will be uh, it will be, you will feel more at home actually, uh, more accepted. Um, and like all our events are mostly conducted in English and uh, we, we invite a lot of people from other uh, backgrounds to come over, have dialogue. That's one way we want to help our participants to learn about other cultures um, and to practice their English language, yeah. Yeah, and just to give a few examples of the type of programs that, that I've personally attended from Young's group, there's a, 
recently Giovanna Ricci, mm -hmm. a poet. Riccio, yeah. Riccio, Giovanna a po Riccio. Yeah. Giovanna Riccio, mm -hmm. uh, a poet here in Toronto who's done a dissertation about the Barbie movie and did an analysis of that. That was really great. Exactly. I remember attending the one with the two jazz musicians, mm -hmm. working musicians in mm -hmm. New York who mm -hmm. have fantastically successful careers mm -hmm. talking about racism. And my first cousin once removed, George Eliot Clark, Ooh. and mm -hmm. James Rolfe mm -hmm. presenting Poets in Song. And this was where George took poets of record, took their works, and had James cast them into classical and uh, sort of operatic pieces. Very interesting stuff. And, you know, every every seminar, every then you've done so many of them, they're all different and they're all kind of interesting to anybody. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Now, John Kennedy, I'm going to put you on the spot because I know you've done a lot of work with the blind and with art. And I wondered if maybe you had something to say about anything. Since we don't have a lineup of speakers here, I, I'm going to take my cane and draw you in. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Sheila. And uh, one of the things I should tell you is that I have been working um, pretty much my entire career with the blind. And my particular angle is that I ask blind people who have never drawn in their lives before and are totally blind, and they're of all ages, uh, I ask them to make drawings and I give them a raised line drawing kit available from the Swedish Organization for the Blind and it is a board that has a rubberized side and you put a plastic sheet on top of the rubberized side and you take an ordinary ballpoint pen and you write on the plastic sheet and oddly enough the line comes up and you can feel it. So blind kids and blind adults who've never drawn in their lives before can make drawings and I would say to them, would you like to make a drawing? And they would say, no, and I've never drawn in my life before. And I would say, well, take up thy pen and draw. <laughs> and they would take up their pens and they would draw. And they would say, oh my god, I can do this. I would say, could you draw a hand, could you draw a glass, could you draw a table? Things like that. One gal said I wanted to draw a horse. And she drew a horse and the horse's leg, well, when I draw a horse's leg, it always ends up looking like the horse is wearing pajamas. But when she drew it, really, the, she got the leg right. Those sort of funny angles that are present in a horse's leg down in that last little bit where the hoof comes forward, she got that. I was so impressed. Uh, but one story I would like to tell you about is, um, is about a blind girl in Taiwan. Because one of my students who came here from Taiwan and then went back to Taiwan, she asked a 13-year-old girl to draw a car. And she said, can you draw a car going down the road? Can you draw a car stopped? And can you draw a car with its brakes on? Now that's challenging for anybody. And the 13-year-old blind girl, blind from birth, in Taiwan, she drew a car going down the road and she made it long. Because it's going. And she made one end big, sort of to show front end and back end. And then when she drew the car stopped, it shrank. And the wheels now went back up inside the body of the car, so it couldn't go. <laughs> it was stopped. So how would you draw the car with its brakes on? Well, you go back to long, because it's going. You change the two ends to show, oh yeah, there's real direction in this car. And finally, she drew the wheels as rectangles. <laughs> so it would slew to a halt. Mm -hmm. What a clever, inventive girl. The idea behind all of this is that we thought for thousands of years pictures are for sighted people. 
But if you ask blind people to draw, they can do it. And I am just delighted that this uh, Xinyi Chao from uh, Taiwan is really gung-ho about all of this and is making waves in Taiwan and getting known, I think, through the Chinese-speaking world, creating a, an organization uh, for art, the blind, and Chinese uh, people, certainly in Taiwan, and she's reaching out to the rest of Asia now, and I hope her organization you know, makes waves. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joan, for helping the blind people realize their art dream. Yeah, and that ghost idea could be an idea for some invention, maybe. <laughs> maybe some cars can be designed that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Janice? Hi. I had some questions about your organization. One is, how big is the organization? Are you in more than one location? Oh, and yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and how many people are involved with the East-West? Okay, so we are actually a small organization. Um, we Now we have a board of uh, six directors. Uh, everyone being volunteer, we don't have uh, funding, actually, to hire anybody or to rent an office. Um, we have a registered member, so they, they say they pay $20 a year as membership. Uh, we have now uh, 46 members, and uh, uh, one-fourth of them are actually non-Chinese, um, but the most of them. Um, three quarters, uh, first generation Chinese immigrants. Um, so we're still small. Um, if you visit our website, you might find it's very simple. It's like a blog. But if you really read through those events, so uh, all our past events and the latest events uh, uh, listed there, you probably find we actually, we, yeah, we work very hard uh, to focus on the quality of the programs and we want, yeah, what we want is to provide quality programs uh, for cross-cultural learning and for communicating to people, especially the, the immigrant uh, community. Many of them are not so, you know, they're first-generation immigrants. Uh, I, we want to make it very accessible to them, <laughs> not because they cannot pay for anything. They cannot have access to, to quality programs. Thank you. Go ahead, Lorna. 